Hello everyone. It's Mike Levin on Tuesday, May 16th. I should know because I shot one of these already. And I am on the avenue. I took my kid too. That's not a trash can. Here on Seventh uh, Avenue, Seventh Avenue, and Forty Second Street. And I was here for the art exhibit, uh, coordinated by a dear friend of mine for the past I don't know, 15, 20 years, I don't know, something like that. Who leads up an organization called Surmountable, and uh, wow. Wow, on lots of levels. Which is first, you know, coming out to here is like no big deal. It's a pain of a commute, but there's no way I'm gonna hop back into the dungeon of the subway. I'll at least go to Penn Station, right? 42nd Street to Penn Station. It's gonna be an interesting walk. I'll talk about stuff. And uh, I love like the Rasta guys. So New York has a new smell. <laughs> There's my trash can. Let's see, recycling. This is recycling because it is tinfoil and stuff. And so there, there used to be a very distinct smell of New York, and that was urine. And it is now replaced by weed. Uh, from the moment you come off the ferry to uh, <laughs> the moment you come out of the subway. And it's, uh, I guess it's legal here now, so hey. Denmark and stuff, right? Uh, I, won't, I won't let it stop me from taking my walk. And there's all kinds of interesting places that I hear. It's loaded with memories. And it, uh, it gets into your psyche, you know? Uh, there is a certain energy here. I'm in the most ter stereotypical uh, tourist area of possibly all New York, Times Square. And uh, I couldn't resist pulling out the camera and uh, giving a look around. I mean, I guess at some point the Empire State Building will be visible. It's a, a beautiful purple tonight. And uh, I got so much to talk about. So much to talk about. What is the topic going to be? How could it not go to Rabbit Hole Linux. I've been in training for this for a very long time. Uh, probably starting 12, 13, maybe 14 years ago when I realized that the main thing that sets people back from taking a more technical route in life is the ability to have continuity over time for your skills to gradually build over time as they do with a musician or an athlete who is using the same equipment. Who is, you know, I'm beating a dead horse, but you know, very few, either very few get the message or very few can act upon what it means to have received the message. Planned obsolescence is real. Designed obsolescence, keeping you buying, keeping you from having the achieving the level in life that is inherently capable inside of you as a human being who can get better at things over time, is being deliberately denied to you. And it's not a conspiracy, it's just a fact. User interfaces change so that they can sell you the next, the newer, the better. And, uh, you know, user interfaces changing is, is the worst because it's the way you use things. It touches directly on your muscle memory. And I could give example after example, but y'all know what I'm talking about. How many of you are not as expert as something you started out with that, that you might be by now because the tool's different. The tool's not available. The tool's too expensive, etc., etc. And, uh, even things as simple as Microsoft Word go through these radical changes and floating pallets are the worst. When things go onto some docking ribbon interface and they can be moved around, 
that means they're never twice same place and they change dynamically when you change the window size. This keeps you from getting better and faster over time, period. There, there's no two ways about it. it you know, fixed versus floating. Of all those places you want to be static in your life, the APIs to the tools you use every day is one of them. But you might say, Mike, this is, this is impossible. So the other book in my hands, you'll see the surmountable from Adam. You'll also see some uh, <laughs> really sustainable uh, forest land chocolates I have for my kid, but that's another story. You'll see Hackers and Painters by, by Paul Graham, of course. Well, Paul Graham, one of the greatest writers in all tech. So let me make a comment right there. So many things seem antiquated and obsolete now with the dawn of AI. It's that whole moment that reality is so much different than uh, all the pundits' predictions and even sci-fi has ever led us to believe. It's not true. They hit on all the issues that are just surfacing now that come away. They were thinking about it maybe a little differently, but Paul Graham, for example, is one who will very much tell you that there is one language to rule them all. If you're interested, Google on the blub, B-L-U-B, blub, Paradox. The Blub Paradox, which is what got me interested in Paul Graham in the first place. And this book was given to me by Tanya Nam, who knowing my, uh, you know, love of Paul Graham's essays on the internet, uh, got me this as a gift. And it's been 10 years, 12 years, something like that, since I kind of fell off my horse, you might say. And I uh, was not quite the person I uh, was when I came to New York. I... <laughs> lost my ability. I had a life. I had a kid, right? This is not an unusual thing. I'm not the only one this happened to. But now as my kid gets to be, you know, older and they're interested in their own things, their own life, I have the time and the freedom to become, to entertain my true nature, to pursue my true inner self. And I immediately reach for the Paul Graham book, which has always been a regret that I didn't really read it. And for a long time, uh, that, though, all those years, I was driven into smaller, more personal spaces. One of the uh, great, oh, that wasn't mine, uh, one of the great uh, escapes that technology has made possible for us, because everyone puts it down, social media, doom scrolling, yada, yada. Well, these phones that are big enough to read off of and which have these OLED screens I think it's organic LED, something like that, but it has true black. When you are not lighting up a pixel, that portion of the screen is off, like the phone is off, and that makes all the difference in the world. Now, when you put the background to black and say the Kindle app, and you make a nice readable, sizable font, that is an ideal writing environment. I'm not writing, I'll write in that environment too, but it's an ideal reading environment. I can go through book after book. I remember, I talk about Fire Upon the Deep a lot, a Werner Vinge book, but I reread, it was one of the first like 800 books, paid books, one of the bigger books, it was the first big sci-fi book that I reread on the iPhone platform, on the little five inch iPhone fives, whatever those were, four inch, something like that. In the last of the Steve Jobs designed iPhones, I read the entire Fire Upon the Deep. And I was like, if I can do that here, Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage, right? <laughs> Minds innocent and quiet can recover sanity. And so I dove into reading again. I got myself a Kindle, because at that time it was still dissatisfying to read off of that tiny thing. So I went e-ink or e-paper for a while, but those things were junk. I went through like three of those. But I, oh, during those three Kindles, I went through the whole Doom, Doom series, not just Frank Herbert's, but I went through his Sons and the Ghost Writers books like Mintat and The Sisterhood. They were all great. They were all easier, more accessible reads. So my acceleration of recapturing who I was all started to happen. And I owe it all to the mobile phones and these same things that's driving so many people into 
you know, uh, bad places in their head. It doesn't have to be. I'm already at 33rd Street or 34th Street, and I'm not ready to go down in the subway yet. I'm going to keep this going for a little bit. I might walk down to Union Square, the first place, the first neighborhood I moved into. Uh, 16th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. My first place I lived in New York City. I went right to Union Square. I had no idea what these neighborhoods were. I didn't know I was going to such a hip, historic place. I explained to my kid who brought up Duck, Duck, Go to me. I'm like, yeah, I know them. And she's like, no, you don't. They're like, no, I don't. I'm sorry, not she. But they're like, no, you don't. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's uh, Fred Wilson, Union Square Ventures. I, you know, I would meet him. I'd go to similar events and stuff. He was uh, one of the money people. Of, of those dot com eras, and he funded DuckDuckGo, so he didn't write DuckDuckGo, but he paid for it. I know the person who, you know, who made that exist, who you're using it today. And they're like, no, yeah, and I'm Union Square Venture Capitals. I used to live there. So I have some interesting stories. I have been through Wonderland, right? So uh, and it goes full circle. Rabbit Hole Linux. Don't be sad, don't get hot. The world is different than it was because Linux is mainstream accessible on the most platform, popular platform in the world. Windows 10, Windows 11, you got Linux. You don't even have to look at Linux. You just got Linux if you want it. So why would you get Linux if you're not even planning on looking at it? Because it makes your copy of Jupyter, where you run Python in a web browser, cloud compatible standard. You start to use Linux as one would use the old Java virtual machine. Write once, run every, run anywhere. Wura, write once, run anywhere. W-O-R-A was the uh, acronym for that. And it never really took off because, well, amongst other reasons, Steve Jobs killed Java like Steve Jobs killed Flash, the Flash player, which was a popular plugin in browsers many years ago for games and stuff uh, but it was it had all these gotchas it was this energy hog it had this user interface that didn't work well on mobile so steve jobs was like f it we won't support it on iphone and so that was the end of uh a flash I, if the flash player wasn't part of the mobile revolution that the iphone kicked off then flash was dead well java went much the same way It's also a security problem, endless upgrades, and even though it was right once run anywhere, it actually fulfilled on that promise, the language was awful. The kinds of convolutions you had to do in your brain, it was not for the, <laughs> for the casual, it was not for the soft blues, it was the, for the hard green arrows who were, you know, billing by the line of code, the man hour. Uh, it was a great era apparent for Visual Basic back in the day, the consulting world, who was, you know, bilking all the companies out of money for, you know, internal applications. So uh, the banking industry really latched on to Java. They shouldn't have, they should have latched on to the ADA, the ADA language, but they latched on to Java for whatever reason. And, uh, it, it, it hangs on and it claws on today. You think, wait, JavaScript is so popular today. Absolutely true. JavaScript is popular because it's the language of the web browser. JavaScript is not Java. Java is Java. JavaScript is JavaScript. They've got some similarities in their syntax, but their entire reason for being uh, is completely different. So excuse me while I fix my hair. Did I see the Empire State Building? It's probably a really good place to see it here. Either that or I'm directly under it and it's a terrible place to see it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll post a picture on Instagram. Okay. So another okay, so if you used a Java virtual machine, you were normalizing your code. You could use normal code. Same code anywhere. Last programming language you'll ever have to learn. That was the promise of Java. Now, they weren't the first to do this. They were using this Java virtual machine concept. And uh, that only just took the basic premise of the C language and BCPL before, before it one step further, where you could 
you know, write your C code and compile it on any platform. That was like ye old virtual machine. Virtual machines before virtual machines was the fact you could compile C source code on different hardware platforms so long as the compiler existed on that hardware platform. And it was a way of booting entirely new hardware to have an operating system because you, you somehow get the compiler on it, then you can port Unix to it. You have Unix on it, you can write applications. Those applications can run compiled C code. So you've got this righteous, almost virus-like cycle. You'll hear, you'll hear people say, especially in like the Unix haters handbook, a uh, mimetic uh, success before the term memes was around. And I have a term that goes back to the 70s. So there was a very popular book, the Unix haters handbook, which is sort of tongue in cheek because it points out all the reasons the Unix was really so virally successful. All the same traits that exist today in Linux, uh, it discusses. And uh, so it was, it was a righteous trick. This concept of uh, the portability of code is a good one. C is not the best way to do it for everybody because it requires such a large commitment in your life. It takes so many cycles out of your life uh, to be a competent C programmer, as it does with Java. So what you really want is a really easy peasy language that has that same level of universal interoperability, as was promised with compiled C and the Java runtime engine, Java virtual machine, JRE, JVM, a lot of acronyms, but basically a platform to run code on where your code could be identical. And when I say identical, I don't mean casually identical. I mean the paths, you know, where configuration files are stored, where data files are stored. Everything was exactly the same on every platform. That is huge. So today we've got these uh, Windows backslash paths. And on the Mac, We've got these strange uppercase user directories. They both break paths. They both make each platform proprietary. Even Unix on the Mac is proprietary. The things you write can't run on other Unix, much less Linux platforms, without significant modification. Now, what's different now than it was before? What's different now than it was before is no platform is credible if it can't run the machine learning, the AI, the data science packages that's powering, say, the open AI revolution, the uh, Redemption of science. The field of science was under attack by creationists, demagogues, and ludites. And they had a fair point because 30% of scientific studies could not be reproduced, revealing the scientists as the lying hypocrites that they were. That was not a sustainable position. It was untenable, they call it. The uh, crisis of reproducibility, some called it. So what happened is the principles of uh, documentation, of documenting a process, were all mixed and mingled in with the code on these very expensive, very proprietary and very academic platforms like Mathematica, uh, Maple, uh, Matlib. Those are probably the three big ones, the three M's, right? You were either using Matlib, Mathematica, or Maple. Very expensive licenses, but they all had this wonderful advantage of mixing documentation with code and with data, which keeps it all intact in this highly accountable, highly distributable way that anyone who pulled it up and pressed that button got the same results. That's kind of a big deal. Enough, in fact, to solve the crisis of reproducibility in science. Now, 
scientists, <laughs> academics, financial people, being who and what they are, are not gonna pay these proprietary licenses for the right to run their code the same way twice. So you've got this Frederico, last name I always forget, who created IPython, I-P-Y-T-H-O-N, IPython. It still lurks underneath Jupiter today, but what it did was it uh, gave you a very interactive command line console running Python very interactive. It's basically froze the code. You didn't feel it freeze, but it suspended the running of the code every time you ran a little cell block. So you could just keep adding real time running code on and inspecting the values of variables and, you know, uh, changing the vari value of variables. It was like permanent interactive debug mode. And it makes a lot of difference. Some people called it a REPL, read, eval, print loop. Yeah, I just call it awesome, but it was the <laughs> the same black command line windows that turns everyone off to that kind of stuff, the, the CLI, the terminal. And so the same guy, Frederico, I'll get your last name, uh, and it's not Fr Frederico Corbato, that's a whole different story. Just as important, more important, time sharing. But uh, the Frederico of IPython said, you know what? With one little tweak, rolling in a few texts like uh, zero MQ, you know, a, you know, a zero overhead message queuing technology that took care of the, I talked about inter-process communication on the Amiga with AREX. IPC is really important, parts in your system talking to each other, even if it's on the same computer, inter-process communication. Well, there's a part called ZMQ or zero MQ. Uh, it exists on a lot of platforms. It's one of these generic engines that's in a lot of things. The way the SQL light engine or the uh, regular expression engine is built into a lot of things. Uh, so is zero MQ these days. So the IPython folks said, we'll take that and we will uh, give it a web user interface. And Jupyter was born. J U P Y, Jupiter, like the planet Jupiter, but the P Y of Python. It's a brilliant name. But because it's confusing and tied to Python and all that stuff, uh, all the people who use it to host Jupyter notebooks don't call it Jupyter. They say, oh, it's a Python host. It has nothing to do with Jupyter. Well, there's one of the myths I'm going to bust. Uh, Colab, Azure Notebooks. Kaggle, Binder, all these things, they're not notebook hosts, they are Jupyter notebook hosts. I'll say, no, it's like Python down underneath. It's the same guy who wrote both, who just made the name change for uh, the reason of promoting something else in the web browser instead of this name that's already associated with a black console. So long as it's web-based, it's Jupyter, folks. Sorry, you're all running Jupyter. Uh, or the cloud hosts are running Jupyter for you. Now, the significance of this is that you had easy access to Python because getting on the Python bandwagon, there was no really clear way to do it. Every approach had some fatal flaw to it, including Jupyter because it was the host operating system using some host operating system proprietary recompiled, dealing with kooky, you know, proprietary platform path issues. You know, handling of EXEs, handling of queues. There's a lot of different things that they just have to go in there and mess around with. So even though it's the official Python specification, C Python, whether you're on a Mac, whether you're on a Windows machine, it is not the interoperable virtual machine portable code platform that people will lead you to believe. There will always be a porting task. And it's not easy. Things break mysteriously, they break often, and your code just doesn't flow from platform to platform. Unless you use the Java virtual machine trick, but instead of a JVM, you're using a Linux VM. How is that so easy and possible today? Excuse me while I sit down and 
recollect myself, because this is hard. I'm carrying Adam's t-shirt here. He designed this t-shirt, surmountable. Google it, look it up. It's a wonderful social cause. And, uh, whoops, don't want to lose that chocolate. That's my kid's chocolate. This is uh, people who make this chocolate. They, uh, they sail from uh, the coast of Europe. They're from France, but they sail all the way across the Atlantic to uh, one of the countries in uh, South America that does sustainable uh, cocoa growing and stuff. They buy the uh, ingredients and then they sail it all the way back to Europe to make these bars. So uh, even with all that transportation, it is still uh, environmentally friendly, uh, progressive chocolate. So I recommend that it's grain, uh, grain, they sail, sail is the name. Surmountable and sail, two good causes. The third good cause is taking advantage of the fact that no proprietary platform has credibility anymore if it can't easily host a Linux virtual machine. Why is that? The cloud, uh, the machine learning libraries, uh, all the Amazon libraries, uh, having developed to develop locally for deployment in the cloud. All these scenarios eventually lead you to the conclusion that if only you were running Linux locally, everything would just magically work. And indeed it does. If you're running Linux locally, everything you do just magically works. It's like you have the promise of Java today, but not limited to a particular programming language. It has a Python bias, admittedly, because I use this trick to run Jupyter, the Linux version of Jupyter. So when you reach a notebook, through your web browser, right? That's what it's all about here. And I'm not still not getting on the subway. How far have I gone here? I'm at 19th Street. I might walk all the way to the ferry, depending. And, you know, it's got the, the whole point of me, for me, now, as other people have other uses for this kind of tech. But for me, the point is to get Jupyter running with a genuine Linux backend. So that your Python is a Linux Python and all your paths are forward slashes, and all your home directories are under slash home, and your code can run just as easily on your local machine, and when it comes time to scale it out to thousands of instances, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of instances, the same exact code that you're running locally can get deployed by many number of technologies like Ansible or even just plain old Git. Uh, into the cloud and scale. You've got your horizontal scaling in that way. You got your vertical scaling too because these single instances can be very powerful, multi-core in themselves, right? So uh, lots of memory, lots of speed in a single instance of Linux. So you scale vertically, you scale horizontally. You start out right using the power of your local machine, all the proprietary, Desktop operating systems have to allow you to do this now through multi-pass on the Macintosh to get Ubuntu. There's other ways, but that's the easiest. And through Windows Subsystem for Linux, which is basically just part of Windows now. Linux is built into Windows. Surprise! So by running one little script, you get a Linux virtual machine that can be completely invisible. You don't even have to look at it but it'll power your Linux back-ended, genuine C Python. C Python the way it was meant to be. No compromises, no weird platform adjustments, just the same Python that is powering OpenAI. The same Python that was used to write the OpenAI probably crawlers, uh, training the model, and maybe not now today, the stuff that's deployed, you know, for the chat GPT and Bing user interfaces, that's usually still JavaScript for 
uh, web executable performance reasons, ASMs and stuff, but we'll get to that later. But everything leading up to it, all the stuff that really has what I consider the interesting parts, the intelligence of the whole system, because web apps are web apps, but training an AI, raising a machine child, now that's interesting. And you can do that. You can start doing it today. You can grab my rabbit hole Linux, start using Jupyter Notebooks in your favorite web browser. I would recommend Edge because Edge lets you create a standalone icon, a standalone app icon for Jupyter. You don't have to run it, quote, in a web browser. You can make a standalone app too. I even give you a pretty icon for it in the works, but that is the first step. That is going through the rabbit hole and falling down into the Linux wonderland with almost no commitment because the install script is one click easy. Jupyter is just available after that. You don't even have to open a terminal window. You don't have to look at Linux at all. It is very much the equivalent of just getting Jupyter by installing Anaconda, just getting Jupyter by installing Desktop Jupyter from GitHub, but you're just getting Jupyter by running the Drink Me script of Rabbit Hole Linux and you get a much better Jupyter, a much better Jupyter. So it's better for a number of reasons. Anaconda is very large. Anaconda installs the kooky, proprietary desktop operating system versions of Python, so non-standard Pythons. Uh, Anaconda uses a different uh, repository system, its own little repository system, so you can't, well, you can just pip install things, but once you do your first pip install, you have mixed installer context, and that gets pretty scary. So, for these reasons, I don't use Anaconda. They also change their license on you. You can't use it for commercial reasons uh, without violating their license. You gotta pay a pretty penny now. Then there's Jupyter Desktop. And then another guy whose name I forget, but he's a Netflix guy and one of the key players in the uh, Jupyter Foundation. Uh, Project Jupyter, we call it. And, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. let's see. <laughs> Don't want to lose my train, right? It got to be a, a combination of being in the moment and uh, talking with spontaneous expertise, right? You can't really do this kind of thing until it's all in your muscle memory. Even the story, even the backstory of all this, it just kind of flows naturally. So a guy from Netflix who's a big project lead on Project Jupiter has made a standalone installer. Here's another opportunity for the subway to get on the one infamous one in my life that has played such a big role. Uh, so distractible, right? So my work is to deal with distraction, right? All this, so what about, where is all this leading? Well, <laughs> if you enjoy the rabbit hole, if you're like, hey, Mike, you built something nice here. This is really uh, the heir apparent to the new way of installing Jupiter, which I think it's going to become if anyone like really opens their mind and just, you know, gives it a try. I'm trying to make it as appealing as possible, wrapping it in all the Alice in Wonderland metaphors and the uh, Neo and Morpheus taking the red pill and playing video games, right? Suspended disbelief, the suspended bis disbelief that you do when you uh, open yourself to a new user interface which people do all the time in games. So just put yourself in a game mentality and you will be much more capable of taking the next step after Jupyter Python. After Linux Python in your web browser using a product called Jupyter. The next step is Neo Vim. Vim, Neo, hey Neo, you gotta try Vim. And then you're really, you know, getting out of the matrix. You're breaking yourself out of the simulation. The simulation that keeps you a slave to planned obsolescence and you can future-proof yourself. Because the API of NeoVim is timeless. It's a fork of Vim, which is timeless, which is the improved version of VI 
which is Timeless, which is the full screen editor of the single line ed program, which no one uses anymore. And there'd be no reason in the world to, now that there's VI. <laughs> so VI is like from the 70s and why would anyone use that? Well, because there's versions of Linux out there that are like 500K, forget a megabyte. BusyBox and ToyBox Linux are like half a megabyte versions of Linux, if you can believe it or not. And they still have text editors, and the text editor they, they include is not the big VI or is not the big Vim or NeoVim. They put the original VI in there, so it's also pre-installed if uh, an operating system. It's part of the Linux and Unix standards. So if you ever encounter a machine that has not been, you know had a enlarged footprint, embedded systems, uh, mostly embedded systems, like your phones run. The VI might be on there already. Someone's gonna be in there for development reasons to uh, do some work, change a config file, whatever. For that, there is always VI. It is pervasive. It is always there. This is why these things are timeless, you see. So, Rabbit Hole Linux introduces you to that world through journaling, through blogging, public blogging by just keeping a single text file for life. Not, not easy to do. So one of the topics that came up with Adam were like, I admire you so much, Adam. You follow your dreams. You came to New York. You opened the door to me to come and follow you. And uh, you headed up this, uh, you know, big... Uh, department of uh, marketers at one of these uh, high-end holding company marketing firms and you're such a soft-spoken guy Adam it's just like you're working this magic that I wish I had I have to be this like or I am this emotional projecting person and then I never want to go after these you know director or vice president roles I've had plenty of them I've been directors I've been vice president but you know look at me they're not me right I don't wear them well I'm much more comfortable being some sort of like specialist or uh you know just don't tie me down don't you know have people answering to me schedules and reports to shoot myself in the head before i live that life but let me develop i don't want to be like a c developer i don't want to be like having to maintain code and be on the hook for this running stuff but let me go wild crazy and do the stuff that data scientists do but a little bit different. Instead of just being the one-off data scientist, because a data scientist is like sitting down at kind of like Excel, but they're using Jupyter most of the time, and they're doing one-off work. They are um, not automating. I automate. I take whatever work that I do, that I sort of flesh out in uh, Jupyter, and sooner or later, it ends up in, in Vim. I want to say Vim, but more often these days, NeoVim. Why NeoVim over Vim? Because NeoVim supports the AIs to help you code. And it's like slapping an Iron Man suit on you. All these aspirational projects that you are at the edge of doing, it's like cutting these catapult ropes. And it's like, oh, I can do that now. I can do that now. The stopping, switching over from your editor to a web browser, Googling, examining five or six solutions, battling the ads, battling the uh, cookie approvals now on all the websites. It's just agonizing. It's, it's, the t it's like the web as a platform is gradually dying because this search experience that I loved so much is becoming worse. So now not only do you not have to go through search to get your answer, you don't even have to leave your editor. You just make a little comment about what you're trying to do. And in a moment, a suggested way of doing it pops up. You can uh, alt tab through different suggestions. You can do that even in NeoVim. It doesn't look like it at first, but NeoVim gives you all the bells and whistles that you get in VS Code. You just gotta, you know, you gotta know them. You gotta look for them. So if you don't like the first suggestion in NeoVim from Copilot, you alt tab, you get the next. You don't like the suggestions, you update your comment and repeat the process. 
So, where this isn't really the AI writing the code for you, it's the AI tutoring you on how to write code. Because it might get it wrong, it often gets it wrong, it most often gets it wrong, but it gives you new insights, ways you can think about it that you didn't think about it before. And this makes all the difference. And I'm blasting my way through projects, including this blogging, journaling thing that I call YAML Chop. So I'm packaging up, and now I'm on N at NYU's university. I'm at Astor Square already. This is just wonderful, man. I'm glad I did this walk. I'll do a little 360 and see the Astor Square place. Hmm. I might just end up walking all the way to uh, the subway after all. Went this far, right? It's not worth going down into the subterranean dungeons. Pizza delivery. I'll be talking about snow crash soon. And pizza delivery and uh, programmer. You're one or the other. <laughs> What a wonderful book. Another book about the rise of AI, another Alice in Wonderland book, lots of chasing the rabbit metaphors. It's probably where I picked it up from. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I should really wrap it up because I keep losing my train of thought. So if you like this kind of video and this kind of free association thinking and documenting what I'm doing, leave a comment. Uh, anyone who watched it through to the end, I'm, I'm really interested. But that sort of hits at home. I'm packaging up a few little repos, my favorite repos. There's Pipulate, the free and open source software. There's YAML Chop, the journaling system. There will be a blank template for a blog. There will be a blank template for a journal. Uh, and then there will be a Moz repo, because I work for Moz, and everything I, I do now, really, in, in my free time, is being paid for by them. So I am going to make as much of this as possible lead you to using Moz product, Moz Pro, the Moz Links API, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so a few repos and lots and lots of tutorials that walk people through this and get them through these steps on the way to this future proofing, this resisting obsolescence, uh, this overcoming the designed obsolescence of your skills so that it can keep making mostly big tech money. And you know, it's not a conspiracy. Planned obsolescence is a real thing. Google the light bulb conspiracy. You'll see, this is just how, how the work is done. And the public at large, the developer community, is hopeless to resist it. You know, you will be assimilated. You will use VS Code. I use VS Code. I have six versions of VS Code. VS Code and VS Codium. Windows, Mac, and native Linux. That's a two by three matrix. I use them all. None of them hold a candle. None of them can change my habits uh, from NeoVim. It's just that much more versatile, timeless, powerful. There's nothing I see in VS Code that is not massively preferable under NeoVim. Speed, responsiveness, load time, uh, the prettiness of the code, uh, the non-strangeness of the code because VS Code is strange by design. It's a strange user interface. Now NeoVim is a strange user interface too, but it's a strange user interface that's lasted about 50 years and going. A strange user interface that comes and goes as I guarantee you VS Code will because Visual Studio before it from which VS Code stole its name. That's the one that's kind of being retired in Sunset for the new thing with a whole new user interface, but the same name to trick you, to make you think they're not doing this to you. But all your muscle memory just magically disappears and you have to restart and you have to relearn and you're set back. Uh, Google Fire in Motion, a Joel Spolsky seminal article. I told you about the blob paradox, one language to rule them all which is where a lot of this began, right? One language to rule them all, the first and last language you'll ever have to learn because it's a superset of all other languages. All other languages that exist are a extraction, a subset, a domain specific problem language that could be written in Lisp because Lisp is that powerful, that fundamental, 
and it's mostly based on S functions, a linked list. I'll get into all these topics later, but the problem with that is you're always building it up from scratch. The pre-built component parts are not big enough. They're not lumpy enough. Python has exactly the right lumpy size, sorry, of uh, exactly the right lumpy size of pre-built components, specifically list tuples and dictionaries, but also a lot of other stuff. It has just the right compromises because every programming language is an opinionated compromising framework. It makes it easier than coding in assembly, but always at a price. And so the compromises and the opinions of the language are the price of not having the power of a truly low level language. So you gotta like the compromises and the sacrifices and the imperfections and the little curly cues and the accidents of the evolution of the language, they all got them. Very few things are pure in tech. So for me, you know, for my energy I'm gonna invest into it, the very best one is Python, hands down, and I've tried a lot, right? A lot of these types of languages that have been retired in the past are Perl, been there, TCL, been there, uh, newer stuff that's like that. Well, of course, when Java came along, I tried to jump on the Java bandwagon. It was had all the right marketing hype, but the reality didn't follow through, so been there. Ruby, when Ruby on Rails came along, I hated Rails, but I liked Ruby. But then I hated Ruby because forced OO when you didn't need to do OO. I mean, that's too much calories you're burning in your head when you just don't have to be. So Python made all of just these right 80-20 rule compromises, and you know, little nuances, the nuances and details matter. And Guido Van Rossum, the creator of Python, his nuances and details are my nuances and details. And if you wanna get a feel for it, go into Jupyter, download, you know, download the Drink Me script, get Rabbit Hole Linux on your system, go into Jupyter through your browser, and as your first thing type, import space this, all lowercase, the word import space this, and run it. And you'll get the Zen of Python. And you'll start to get some idea of the mindset behind it. You know, uh, explicit is better than implicit, uh, but implicit is okay if it's not, you know, if it's the way most people wanna do it. I can't even paraphrase it all, but it's a beautiful piece of work. There's a song written about it that Michael Kennedy from Talk Python, to me, loves to promote. Uh, so this is a language that reaches out to people like Michael Kennedy, who, you know, started out on C and Scheme doing this, you know, the, the classic comp sci of maybe the 90s approach to this stuff which has been replaced by Python, even by the people who invented Lisp and had the most legendary comp sci program in the world, MIT, the birthplace of artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, their comp sci 101 class was synonymous with Lisp. They use Python now. Scheme has been phased out because there is a winner. There's a winner because it's the best language on which to teach modern literacy, not computer literacy, modern literacy, period. In the same way the English language has become the language of tech, Python is becoming the programming language of tech. It's replaced Perl as like the operating system helper language. So right there, it's more ingrained in tech than the web, than uh, the web browser ingrains JavaScript. You think JavaScript is ingrained in tech because it's in the browser. The browser is just a user interface for humans. It'll come and go. It's just an optional UI. It's kind of like how they bundle in a SQL engine, a regex engine, you know, web browsers and JavaScript. It's just like PostScript. You know, when laser printers went away, PostScript went away. So, you know, don't bank too much on JavaScript for these exact same reasons. But Python, Python's the new Perl. Perl went away because its fundamental principles couldn't last under the stress of time. 
Python's fundamental principles are only serving it better and better over the course of time. Concurrency hits, async await. It's not a good enough concurrency, whatever that thing is, trio, I don't know. There's other models that get rolled in that don't become part of the standard library for a while because the standard library is where code goes to die. It gets standardized, no one wants to change it. Uh, so all these vibrant third-party libraries that experiment with pushing forward the state of Python start to blossom. And maybe someday one will get incorporated and replace an old core component, but then they have reverse compatibility to deal with and stuff. So even Python has its little compromises. URL lib is, is ugly, but it's always gonna be there. And they're not gonna put the, uh, I mean, you see this, all these electric vehicles popping up. Uh, I gotta do something better than my big uh, bulky folding electric bike. I wanna do, uh, something I can take out here on the subway and just uh, zip up and down. I'm on Varric now. Varric. Did I make a wrong turn? Is this going to take me south to the ferry? I see the Holland Tunnel uh, entrance signs up there. I might have to make a turn. But I'll probably wrap it up. I got to get my head back into the game on my uh, directions here and I got a good video out of this I hope I introduced you to the concept of rabbit hole Linux I hope it tempts some people I hope uh, this kind of video is of interest to people because if it is you know I'll come out to New York and take a stroll through it just for the sake of shooting one of these videos so thanks for joining me hope to see you again soon and don't forget to leave comments and interact and and reach out to me. I, I'm starting to actually be interested in what people think out there because, you know, working for Moz as I do, I am no longer a behind closed doors keeping proprietary secrets kind of SEO like I had to be in the past. I'm just going to give it all out. <laughs> Get you to buy Moz product to help you do a lot of it. But, you know, everything has a price. That's the price. See you soon.